Hi, this is the lecture for ancient medieval history for Tuesday after the first semester final. What we did yesterday is we looked at the immediate causes of the First Punic War, the course of the First Punic War, and the aftermath of the First Punic War. To summarize, who will rule the Western Mediterranean? Rome or Carthage? It's going to be one or the other. Both of them start out roughly equivalent in power. And the first war is going to be over control of these islands, of Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica. Rome controls Italy and eastern Sicily. Carthage controls North Africa, southern Iberia, Sardinia, Corsica, and western Sicily. The problem Rome has is it doesn't have a single warship at the beginning of the First Punic War, which for a naval-oriented, island-oriented conflict is kind of a problem. So what happens is the Romans have to improvise, adapt, and overcome. They have to come up with a solution that's going to allow them to achieve victory against the most effective mariners in the world at sea. They're lucky in that a warship ends up landing on their coast after a storm, which they can copy, and they then develop the corvus, which is a ramp that they can swivel and thwomp down, thwomp, that's a scientific term, thwomp down on an anemone, on an anemone, anemone warship, a little anemone warship. Sea anemone is a little creature, they're cute. Anyway, on an enemy warship, and Roman legionaries then run across the ramp and start killing. Uh, suddenly, what was going to be a sea battle at distance is now a land battle in that uh, the Carthys are not fighting with ballistae and catapults at long range. They're fighting with swords and shields around their own oars. So the Romans win Punic War I. They adapt Carthaginian warships and they change the naval tactics with which sea battles are fought to play to Rome's strengths and Carthage's weaknesses. This is all good and natural and gives Rome a victory. So Rome gets Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica. Carthage keeps a smaller fleet and the region of Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco in modern terms, basically North Africa from Tripoli all the way west to the Atlantic beyond the um, Straits of Gibraltar. So, for the next decade or two, or three, uh, these Punic Wars are in remission. There's an interwar period. And I call it an interwar period because everyone who has any knowledge of the way things work understands that the Carthys will be back. They are not accepting this defeat with grace. They have every intention of avenging themselves against Rome, particularly the greatest general of Carthage of the First Punic War, Hamilcar Barca. Now, Barca is given command of the Carthaginian colony in Spain. And what he does is he uses his army and his genius and his sons to march north and conquer everything south of the Pyrenees, the entire Iberian Peninsula. Those tribes that don't immediately accept Carthaginian rule will stay the heck out of Carthage's way because they don't want to be destroyed. Now, Hamilcar's sons, including Hasdrubal and... Oh, there was another whose name I always forget because it's not a Han or Hasdrubal word. Um, Mago, I think it is. Uh, yeah, Hasdrubal and Mago and Hannibal Barca, uh, they are not raised to be the best uh, they can be. They are not raised to be individuals. They are not raised to discover their dreams and find their talents and swan like spread their wings in the world. They are raised for one purpose as vengeance weapons against Rome. They are going to turn Rome to dust if they can. If hate were people, they'd be China. They are raised 
not only to hate Rome, not only in dedication to their gods to be the instruments of Rome's defeat and destruction, humiliation, and other bad things, words I can't think of right now, um, but they're also trained in military tactics. Hannibal and his brothers, Mago and Hasdrubal, are, are trained in how to use the various types of units. Cavalry for scouts and light attack forces. In infantry as shock army foot soldiers. Um, archers. Uh, how to move across ground. They play tactics and strategy games as children. But by the time they're your age, they're in the field commanding men in battle. And one of the challenges of commanding men in battle is you have to find a way through fear or love, usually a combination of both, to have your men become more afraid of disappointing you than of the enemy's deadly weapons. If you can achieve this, your men will be a weapon that you can wield against your country's enemies to achieve victory. They will fight willingly for you and even die for you. Now, nobody has ever said that that is easy. In fact, it requires a talent that most people are not born with, the ability to get men to follow them into danger, into hardship. But Hamilcar has it, and his sons have it, particularly Hannibal. So, here's what happens. When Hannibal is old enough, he ends up becoming the governor of Carthaginian Iberia, an empire at least as great as the uh, islands that were lost by Carthage in the First Punic War. In fact, what will be discovered by Hannibal and later by Rome is that at that time, Iberia is a great source of gemstones, silver, and gold. It is a storehouse of wealth that the Romans ultimately will completely tap. But it, this is a prize. Iberia is a prize. Meanwhile in Rome, there are people who suspect Carthage's motives, and they are reacting to the notion that Carthage could become a problem again. So there's a war party in Rome ever vigilant against Carthage. Well, a second war starts. And again, the exact reason doesn't matter. Because the real reason for the war is control of the future. The same reason as the First Punic War. Who will rule the Western Mediterranean? Carthage or Rome? Now, everyone in Rome <laughs> expects Punic War II to be a repeat of Punic War I. This is also an, uh, a comparison with World War II. World War II started a lot of people in the West, France particularly, thought it would be a rematch of World War I. It wasn't. So, the Carthaginians make noise about reinvading Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica. To prevent this, the Romans send massive army forces out from Italy to garrison these three islands so that when, <clears throat> quote unquote, Carthage attacks, Rome will be ready to fight them off. So the majority of Rome's military force is sent out of Italy, out of Italy into these barrier islands. Hannibal has the greatest army Carthage ever assembled. An army that includes military engineers, siege specialists who can make siege engines, catapults, ballistae. That includes war elephants. <laughs> capable of terrifying and crushing their enemies underfoot. And Hannibal 
at the outset of war doesn't load all this up onto ships and head to Corsica or Sardinia or Sicily, and he doesn't go back to Carthage. Instead, he'll be very, very quiet, because it's a secret. Hannibal crosses the Pyrenees. Now, he's in southern Transalpine Gaul. The Romans have a garrison at the spot between the sea and the southern Alps, near the city of Arles. But Hannibal isn't going there. Hannibal's going to do the unexpected. In fact, he's going to keep doing the unexpected. Instead, Hannibal's army starts crossing the Alps. Now, the Alps are the tallest mountains in Europe. These mountains have cliffs hundreds of feet high. They have mountains tens of thousands of feet high. There are crevasses that will swallow a whole army. There are flat regions that look like solid ground that are really nothing but snow bridges. And if you cross it wrong, the snow bridge collapses, and you literally get eaten by the charybdis of the... Crevasse or crevice. How on earth is Hannibal going to bring a massive army through the Alps? Well, the answer is he pays off local tribesmen who know the local paths. And like, what was his name? The traitor who gave the Persians the secret of the goat path at Thermopylae. Uh, uh, Ephliates. Like Ephliates, but without treason, Hannibal gets the local guys who understand the details of the mountains at great cost to guide his army through the mountains. Now, the Alps are a strainer of death. In the kitchen, there's a thing called a colander or a strainer. It's like a bowl, but it's made of mesh or it has lots of holes in it. And what you do when you're making spaghetti or some other kind of pasta is you boil the pasta until it's al dente, you know, tender to the tooth. And then you pour the pasta and the water into the strainer or the colander. The water drains out through the netting or through the holes. The pasta remains. Then you put the pasta back in the pot, put some butter in, salt, or put some olive oil and some herbs in, and you've got your pasta. The strainer holds on to pasta, allowing the liquid to pass through. Well, the Alps are a strainer of death. Hannibal loses his siege engineers, any of his siege engines that he was bringing over, and all the war elephants. Hannibal comes out of the Alps with maybe two-thirds of his army. It doesn't include elephants or siege engineers, but that doesn't matter. Not at first. Because when Hannibal appears out of apparently nowhere, the Romans are completely flat-footed. Remember, their major military forces are on the islands, not in Italy. And to the extent they expected somebody might attack Italy, they had Rome protected, they had this area down here protected, and they had a few other troops, but in general terms, nope, not up there. So the Romans scramble a legion. There's a battle. And Hannibal crushes the Romans. These are second-rate troops anyway. The best Roman troops are on the islands. So Hannibal is marching south. And the Romans' only army in North Italy is destroyed. Again and again, the Romans send small armies to try to slow Hannibal down. Meanwhile, they begin recalling troops from the islands and forming the largest land army the Romans had up to that point in history. Once they have this large land army, I've got to look this up. I'm going to make sure I placed Cannae properly. I think I may have put it too far north. Okay. 
Oh, I was right. I knew I had that wrong. Okay. It's not here. It's not here. It's not here. Where could it be? If not there. Let's restore the mountains. My speed will get upset. Skiing. And. The Battle of Cannae should be an orange anyway. It's going to be so. Hannibal's troops end up going east of the uh, Apennines, and they end up marching past Rome. The Romans eventually master, but the, the, muster this massive army. The Romans already expect that in an even battle, Roman legionaries, because of their citizen-soldier dedication to victory, are going to defeat Carthaginian mercenaries. But now they outnumber Hannibal two or three to one. The commanders of the Roman force expect that this is enough. Our troops are better man for man, and we've got many more of them. So the method chosen to win the battle, the tactics chosen by the Romans, are about as subtle as a sledgehammer. The Romans are organized into a giant grid of forces, a big rectangle. And they are going to aim straight at the Carthaginian army and overrun them by sheer numbers. This is not subtle. This is not nuanced. It's not a battle of maneuver. It's brute force. The Romans are coming like a steamroller to crush the Carthaginians. So that's the Roman battle plan. Big, thick mass of troops. Rank upon rank upon rank upon rank upon rank upon rank upon rank. Hannibal chooses the spot of battle, but organizes his troops, which again are less, into a thin line in front of the Romans. Now the Romans aren't going to take this very seriously. But this is the Carthaginian force that the Romans plan on fighting. As the Romans begin to advance, Hannibal orders his cavalry to drive the Roman cavalry off the field at all costs. The Carthaginians are going to engage in a series of almost kamikaze-like suicide attacks, but what they do is they destroy or drive off the Roman cavalry. And because the Romans didn't expect such ferocity, such suicidal hubris, or, or uh, not hubris, energy, uh, the Roman cavalry is driven from the field or destroyed. But the infantry is inevitably marching towards the Carthaginians. Now, the Carthaginians in the front lines are told to hold the Romans just long enough to keep contact with them. So the front of this massive Roman rectangle hits the Carthaginian forces in front of them. And the Carthaginians' forces begin to fight a fighting retreat, which is one of the most difficult maneuvers in warfare at any age, at any tech level. The Carthaginians are fighting the Romans. They're not running away from them. But they're pulling back as they fight, drawing the Romans in deeper and deeper and deeper. The Romans commit their reserves. Now the entire Roman battle force is in this massive rectangle. And the rectangle is being drawn in on the Carthaginians. Hannibal at this point 
plays his gamble. And like all great military victories, it's not a matter of brute force. It is a chance that he took that could have gone very wrong, but didn't. The forces in front of Rome that are behind the front lines pull around to the sides of the Roman force, and they begin to attack the flanks. The front force begins to hold their ground more. So now the Romans, which were expecting to steamroller over the Carthys, are surrounded on three sides by Carthaginians who are attacking. But the Romans have no room to maneuver. They're so densely packed tightly against one another that they are beginning to stop act like an, acting like an army and start acting like a big mob. At this point, Hannibal orders the surviving cavalry to attack the Romans in the rear. Now, the Romans still have so many troops, and they have such good training, that had anyone been able to get control of that mass of Roman forces, they could have picked a direction, all marched in that direction, and fought their way out of the trap. But nobody could take command. It was a mass of crowding men who began to panic. And panic is the mother of all bleep-ups when it comes to military or life. You start panicking, you stop thinking. You start panicking, you start dying. The Roman soldiers panic. But they're in a mob. They can't do anything about it. No one can take command. No one's orders shouts uh, pass beyond the people immediately around him. Every commander that tries to take control of the situation finds his troops jostled out of the way by other Roman troops desperate to get away. Meanwhile, the Carthys are eating in from all directions. The Battle of Cannae is a mass slaughterhouse. The Carthaginians maintain their discipline. The Romans lose theirs. Hour after bloody hour, the Carthaginians get closer and closer to the center. Finally, the center of the Roman army is destroyed. Tens of thousands of Roman soldiers, the flower of that generation's Roman army, is killed in one day on August the 2nd, 216 BC. It's Hannibal's greatest victory. It's Rome's greatest defeat. And it is probably the bloodiest day in the history of warfare west of China that the world has yet seen. That many Romans die. So now the Romans are in serious, 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 did I say serious? Serious trouble. Hannibal is going to be able to march wherever he wants in Italy. The Romans are going to take over a decade to repopulate their army, and everyone knows it. So at this point, Hannibal has every reason to expect he'll win the war. It's during this period that I told you the Romans elect two consuls, one of which is named, one of whom is named Flavius, uh, or Fabius, Fabius. And Fabius's partner wants to attack Car uh, Hannibal because he's reckless or brave, whatever you want to call it. Fabius says, if we go anywhere near that murderer, he'll kill us. We've got to be close enough to mess with his supply lines, but far enough away that he can't come close us and force us to battle. Every day, the pro every day the consul that wanted to attack was in command, because they had to alternate command every other day. That's the Roman method. The Roman army, let's see, I've got to do this right. Neat, 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 marched as quickly as it could towards Hannibal. Then the next day, Fabius took over, and he immediately marched the Roman army back, away as quickly as possible from Hannibal. Fabius and Fabian tactics is the tactic of trying to strain your enemy's ability to hold together, not by beating them in a straight-up fight, but by messing with their ability to eat or to sleep quietly, by keeping close enough to be a plausible threat without being forced into a fight. He is called in Latin Fabius Puncator, which means Fabius the Frustrator. And uh, he does frustrate Hannibal. But for 14 years, Hannibal marches up and down in Italy. Every Roman army that gets close enough is destroyed. So why doesn't he win the war? 
there are basically two reasons for this. First, Fabius, I'm sorry, Hannibal's siege engines and siege engineers were killed in the crossing of the Alps. Hannibal's armies did not have a sufficient number of people who were skilled in the construction of machines that can destroy enemy walls. Catapults that could throw heavy rocks, ballistae that could throw heavy bolts. Uh, I don't think the Romans had trebuchet, that's a more medieval thing, but that's a super heavy catapult. Um, if you remember seeing scenes from The Return of the King, one of the Lord of the Rings movies, they do a good job of showing how catapults work in war. Carthage and Hannibal's army didn't have them, didn't have many of them, didn't have enough of them to face Rome's walls. So that's the first thing. The Romans, like the Athenians, could hide behind their walls whenever Hannibal's army was close. But Hannibal's army didn't remain close, and the Romans could resupply from the sea. Hannibal moved around Italy, was master of everything within his arm's reach, but his arm didn't carry that far because of the second reason why Rome didn't lose the war. Rome had begun to treat its allies well. Rome had begun to offer Roman citizenship to other Italians. Because of this, the Romans never lost the affection or the alliance of most of the Italian city-states. Those areas <clears throat> that had been conquered by Rome, for the most part, remained loyal to Rome. As such, as such, Hannibal is not able to get Italy to rise up with him and join him in an overwhelming attack on Rome, which he doesn't have siege engines for anyway. If the Italians had joined him, then they could have built the siege engines. But they didn't. Not in large enough numbers. So Hannibal is marching up and down Italy for 14 years, frustrated because he can't destroy Rome. And Rome can't destroy him. It's stalemate. But during that time, a Roman commander appears. His name is Scipio. Yeah, I looked it up. That's how you pronounced it. S-C-I-P-I-O is Scipio. Scipio takes a Roman army to Iberia, the area that Hannibal based his army in. And he conquers Roman, uh, Carthaginian Iberia for Rome. In doing so, Scipio develops an understanding of Hannibal's techniques in warfare. Because, well, as a younger man, he faced Hannibal uh, as a, a junior officer, but also the people left behind in Iberia were steeped in Hannibal's approach to fighting. So Scipio learns how Hannibal thinks, how he organizes, and he ends up beating Hannibal's successors in this area. Now Rome controls Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, and Iberia. Carthage controls the North African shore and anything Hannibal could touch in Italy. And then Scipio brings his army from Iberia, not to Italy. He's not going to fight Hannibal in Italy. He brings his army and lands it east of Carthage in North Africa. There is a Roman army, the best Roman army in the field since Cannae, approaching the city of Carthage itself. Emergency orders are sent to Hannibal. Leave your army, return to, Italy, uh, to Carthage with all due haste. Hannibal leaves most of his troops behind, comes back to Carthage, and he's made the military commander of the defense of the city. This is a new army. Largely untested in battle, but Hannibal's the greatest commander in Carthaginian history, and he has some of his officers and men with him. He also has a new unit of war elephants, and these war elephants are going to be the heart of his policy. In a plain east of Carthage called Zema, Hannibal's new army with the war elephants is going to meet Scipio's Roman army. Now, the way Zema works... The Carthaginian plan is to line up their war elephants in front of their foot soldiers. The cavalry will scout around. They'll cancel each other, Roman and Carthaginian. 
the war elephants will charge. And the expectation is that Roman troops will get trod underfoot by the elephants like jelly, that Romans will panic like they did at Cannae, and that in the panic, the elephants will stomp their way over Roman dead and end up, you know, turning around. And by the time they slow down and turn around, the Carthaginian army, which still has discipline, which has not just been rav ravaged by elephants, will hit the Roman army and Hannibal will defeat the Romans. Again, that's his plan. But Scipio is not stupid. He lines up his Romans in a solid rectangle, but much thinner than at Cannae. However, his men have practiced a special maneuver. It's called the step aside maneuver. If an elephant is charging me, what I'm going to do is say, here's the line, separate now. At the last minute, the Roman forces are going to part in the line of attack of each elephant. They're going to double and triple up their lines, creating aisles through which the elephants will charge impotently. I don't know if you heard that. I love my job. Now, they don't kill any Romans, because the Romans have done the step-aside maneuver. It takes the elephants five minutes to slow down and five minutes to turn around. During those ten minutes, which are the critical minutes of the battle, the Roman army reforms ranks and attacks. By the time the elephants are ready to come back, the Roman forces have closed with the Carthaginian forces and are slicing and dicing them to death. Hannibal's infantry is defeated. His elephants are useless because they can't come back. Even if they wanted to attack the Romans, the Romans and the Carthaginians are so intermixed at this point in melee combat and hand-to-hand -hand fighting that the elephants would kill their own men as well as Rome. As well as Roman men. Carthage loses. Hannibal suffers his only defeat. But it's the last battle of the Second Punic War. Carthage loses the Second Punic War. And at the end of the Second Punic War, the only territory that's going to remain to Carthage is within its original homeland. Nothing else. Not the rest of North Africa. Not Iberia. Not any of the islands. In fact, one of Scipio's allies is the king of Numidia, which sends light horsemen with spears and javelins into battle on the side of Scipio's Roman army at Zama. So a new kingdom called Numidia is set up west of Carthage on the North African coast, allied to Rome. Now Hannibal is alive. He surrenders alive, or he's captured alive. Oh! I retract that. He's alive, he survives Zama, and he flees. The Romans don't catch him. Hannibal spends the rest of his life, which I think is about 10, 12, 15 years, and he goes east into the Greek world. His one purpose is to stir up the Greek world, the Macedonian world, against Rome. That's his personal goal. Hannibal wants to cause a war between Greece and Rome, and Hannibal will serve the Greeks. Hannibal, look, if Satan were to fight Rome, Hannibal would go to hell to join his army. That's how serious Hannibal was about being a vengeance weapon. Ultimately, the Romans track him down and kill him. They assassinate him. I believe he was sleeping in his bed. And the Romans come in and stab him to death. So that's how the greatest Carthaginian general ends. Now the other thing that you should know about the peace treaty that ends the Second Punic War is that Carthage makes a promise. It's not allowed a navy. 
It's not even really allowed an army anymore. It's allowed a police force. And it makes a promise never to go to war without Rome's permission. Carthage, if attacked, needs to send an emissary to Rome, to the Senate and people of Rome, asking Rome for permission for Carthage to defend itself. If Carthage goes to war without the Senate and people of Rome say so, the Carthaginians will be in violation of the treaty and Rome will attack. And after the Second Punic War, Rome controls everything, including Numidia, basically, indirectly. Rome has taken over Transalpine Gaul's southern coast, Iberia, uh, Morocco, and as well as the islands. The, the force would be overwhelming. Carthage couldn't do anything about it. So the Carthaginians lose Hannibal, and they give up on their army and their navy and their colonies. They have their homeland left. They have a police force, not an army. And they have to ask Rome's permission in order to defend themselves. Now you'd think that's enough. Rome wins, Carthage loses. And in fact, the Romans begin to take an interest in conquering parts of the Greek world. Hannibal was right. Rome is going their way, in part because the Greeks are so damn quarrelsome. They cannot get behind anyone. Since Alexander, they've been squabbling and dividing. And sometimes Roman citizens get caught in the crossfire. So the Roman legions are beginning to be sent east to deal with conquering the Greek world to bring them into some degree of law and order. But in Rome's Senate, one of the survivors of the wars who will not forget that vigilance is the eternal price of liberty speaks in the Senate frequently. And he has one message above all others. His name is Marcus Porcius Cato the Elder. And Marcus Porcius Cato the Elder could be speaking on sewer policy, or on whether or not to allow truck drivers to bring their cars into the city during the daytime, or tax policy, or whether or not Romans should be allowed to divorce one another. He could be talking about anything on the Senate floor, but he always ends his speech with three words. Oh, and by the way, Cartago de Linda Est. Cartago de Linda Est. I don't know if any of you Latin scholars knows what that means, or any of you history students knows what that means. Cartago de Linda Est. It's written up there. Anyone want to take a shot? Okay. And by the way, I maintain Carthage must be destroyed. Cato for decades argues on the Senate floor that Carthage is still a viper, ready to inject its venom into the unsuspecting soft underbelly of Rome. That if we go east without destroying Carthage, we are inviting our own doom. That the Carthaginians will never love us, they will always hate us, they will always want to overcome us. The only way for Rome to be safe is for Carthage to be completely and utterly wiped off the map. Cartago de Lenda Est. Now, Rome doesn't listen. Not really. They remember, but they don't listen. But then a Numidian king comes along. And that Numidian king, this is Roman over here. That Numidian king says, it'd be a real shame if some of my toughest, bravest warriors were to start, I don't know, raiding into Carthage's territory, stealing women for slaves, stealing children, stealing men, looting villas, and taking valuables from home. Not an invasion or anything, just be a shame if crime like that were to happen. And what the king was really saying when he said that is, Hey, take your bully boys, go to Carthage, and have some violent fun. So, 
the Numidian horseman begin to raid throughout Carthage's territory. It's not a full formal attack. They're not trying to hold ground. But they're raiding. They rape, they burn, they steal, they murder. They come and go like the wind. What's left behind are bruised, broken, and brutalized people and burned out homes. But it is happening so frequently and so brazenly that there is no question in anyone's mind that the Numidians are doing this as an organized thing. That the king of the Numidians has authorized predation upon Carthage, which is an act of war. If the Canadian government encouraged every criminal in Canada to cross the Idaho border and raid into us as far as Moscow, we would have a reason to go to war with Canada. So Carthage sends a mission to Rome, to the Senate and people of Rome. They're told to wait in the lobby. The Senate, when it finds time, will speak to them. Days go by. Weeks go by. Months go by. The attacks intensify. The Romans are laughing at the Carthaginians because the Carthaginians, according to the treaty, have no choice. The Carthaginians can't defend themselves without Rome's say-so. And these are the people who are going to officially ask for Rome's say-so. But the Senate just never makes time for them. Eventually, the Carthaginians realize how bad it is and that the Romans would rather let every Carthaginian man, woman, and child get killed by Numidian raiders than do anything about it. The Romans are having way too much fun. They're being sadistic jerks. And the Carthaginians look at one another and they say, if we're going to die, let's die on our feet with swords in our hands like men, not like sheep being led to the slaughter. The delegation returns to Carthage and the Senate of Carthage authorizes war, not only with Numidia, but with Rome itself, because they understand that Rome is behind the Numidians. The Third Punic War is not really a war, because that would imply some degree of chance for either, either side to win. The Third Punic War is a slaughter. Scipio, who defeats um, Hannibal, is called Africanus, the victory over the Africans. Well, Scipio's great-grandnephew is called Scipio Aemilianus. He is given command because the Romans wanted Scipio in charge of this. The historian Polybius accompanies him as part of his staff and is eyewitness to what happens. Whatever forces Carthage has in the field are destroyed by the Numidians and the Romans. Carthage is surrounded, uh, invested, and besieged. The Carthaginians fight bravely and die bravely. And ultimately the walls of Carthage come down because the Romans outnumber the Carthaginians 10 to 1 or more. And they have military forces and the Carthaginians, they have whoever's in the city willing to hold weapons. When the Romans take Carthage, they kill or enslave the men, they rape and no, I should say kill or enslave the men, they rape and enslave the women, they enslave the children. Carthage is depopulated. More than that, and there are modern historians who whinge about this, but it happened. The order is to sow the ground with soil, with salt. To sow the ground or sow the soil with salt. What does that mean? Well, salt is necessary for life. Without salt in a hot climate, you're going to go die of shock because your body emits salt when it sweats. But if you put salt in farm soil, that soil is going to be blighted and poisoned. It won't be able to grow anything. So what the Romans do is they sow the soil all around the old city of Carthage with salt so that nothing will grow there. They also poison the wells. 
By sowing the ground with salt and poisoning the wells, the Romans make darn sure that Carthage will never rise again. So they've fought Carthage, they've conquered it, they've destroyed it. The surviving people of Carthage are scattered as slaves around the empire or just killed outright. The city of Carthage has its walls torn down, its buildings burnt to the ground, and um, the ground itself is polluted with salt and the wells polluted with poison. And then something funny happens about 50, 100 years later. The Romans, who now rule what they call Africa province, which used to be the homeland of the Carthaginians, they realize that, you know, to control this part of the world, they need a city there. So the Romans go a few miles down the coast, beyond the area of sown with salt, and they build Carthage again. A new Carthage, a Roman Carthage. And this Roman Carthage lasts until the end of the Roman Empire, uh, about seven, eight hundred years later. So who would have thought it was not only necessary for the Romans to destroy Carthage that was, but it was also, ironically, necessary for the Romans to build a brand new Carthage just down the coast to take over ruling that part of the world for them. And that's the end of the story of the Punic Wars. Next time, we will talk about the aftermath. Thank you. You may talk quietly among yourselves. Even you at home. Thank <laughs> you.